So <clears throat> I'm going to share some tips um, on how we can support pollinators in our landscapes. And um, to start off with, I just want to introduce the topic by saying that pollinators are very important to nature and wildlife and also the human diet. Um, and pollinators such as honeybees are vital for our U.S. agriculture industry and economy. Uh, they po pollinate a variety of crops, um, which include apples, blueberries, oranges, and almonds, just to name a few. And in urban landscapes, many flowering native plants, which are key food sources for pollinators, have been replaced by houses, roads, lawns, and whatnot. Um, so there are some definite ways that we can try to help support pollinators in our landscape. <clears throat> By supporting pollinators in our landscape, we're helping to support honeybee populations. We're also providing shelter and food for native bees and other pollinators. Um, and I will be using the word native a lot. I should probably define that. Native means that whether it's a pollinator species or a plant, that particular species is um, originates from a specific area or region and is adapted to that area's climate, soil types, those types of things. And so when possible, uh, we want to grow native plants to support the native pop pollinator population. So that's what I mean when I say native. So also supporting pollinators in our landscape can ensure good pollination for our fruits and vegetables that we might grow in our backyards. We can also see um, an increase in yields and in some cases, depending on the fruit or vegetable, a larger uh, fruit or vegetable. And then additionally, supporting pollinators in our landscape provides some seasonal long beauty and diversity as well as um, focal points and, and other interests. So today's talk, we're going to define what a pollinator is. We'll introduce some different types of pollinators. Uh, and then we'll talk about the importance of pollinators and some ways that we can support pollinators. And so to start off with, uh, just a simple diagram of a flower and the flower parts. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know all of the flower parts, but just put the diagram up there so that as I'm talking, you have something to reference um, the different parts. So pollinators can be anything that helps to carry pollen from the male part of the flower, which is the stamen, and they, it carries it to the female part of the same or another flower, the stigma. So the female part of the plant is called the stigma, the male part is called the stamen. And some plants actually have both male and female flowers on them. Uh, cucumbers is an example. Uh, when cucumbers set their first blossoms, typically those first blossoms are male flowers and therefore they will not set fruit. So it's usually the second flush of blossoms that produces our fruit or our, our cucumber. Um, some flowers just have male flower, or some plants just have male flowers and some plants just have female flowers. And so then it requires a pollinator to transfer the pollen from the male flower to the female flower to result in pollination. And pollination can happen either intentionally or incidentally. Um, for example, some animals such as many bees intentionally collect pollen, while others such as many butterflies and birds move pollen incidentally because the pollen just sticks on their body uh, while they're collecting nectar from the flowers, and that's how it gets dispersed. There's also direct and indirect pollination, um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, um, but 
I want to point out that many of our fruits and vegetables do require insects to carry the pollen from one plant to another. So keep that in mind as we continue with the, the presentation today. So when we're talking about direct and indirect pollination, some crops are pollinated by pollinators, and some crops are wind pollinated. In the United States, honeybees perform much of our insect pollination, but there are help from other pollinators, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so honeybees, therefore, are very are vital to our agriculture industry and our economy. And they pollinate a variety of popular crops, um, which you'll see on the left hand of your screen. Um, the, the cereal grains, which are on the right side, like wheat, corn, and rice, which happens to make up the largest part of the world diet, um, they don't need pollinators. This is because the crops on the right, cereal crops on the right, are wind pollinated. And soybeans are also wind pollinated crops. Honeybees are probably our most well-known pollinators and North Dakota happens to be the number one honey producing state in the United States. Um, in 2018, according to the North Dakota Department of Ag, uh, we produced 38 million pounds of honey valued at roughly $71 million. And according to a variety of different sources, uh, pollinators are generally responsible for one in every three bites of food that we eat. Uh, this includes 120 different crops, which are mainly fruits, vegetables, and nuts. And pollinators contribute approximately 15 to 20 billion dollars in U.S. crops, or they contribute to the crops because of their pollinating efforts. Um, one sp specific crop that absolutely needs pollinators uh, to achieve pollination is almonds. Um, some of our other crops, like um, berries, maybe need a pollinator, but maybe not. Some you have to have two different types of cultivars, and that requires a pollinator to transfer pollen from one to the other. There's also um, berry species like raspberries, that the more of the um, female parts that are pollinated, the better quality the raspberry will be. So the less mushy it might be. <clears throat> so thinking back to pollinators and pollination, um, and you can use your chat box for this one, beyond the honeybee, what are some other pollinators that you can think of? And Julie, I'll rely on you to monitor the chat box. I'm seeing butterflies, hummingbirds, bats, flies, moths, mason bee. Oh, good. How are they doing? Very good. <laughs> Very good, and I'm especially excited to hear that someone mentioned a mason bee, uh, because mason bees are one of our North Dakota's um, native pollinator bees. Um, they're generally somewhat solitary, so very excited to hear about that. We won't be covering all of the, the different species of native pollinators, but we'll just be giving an overview. So very pleased to see that wide range. Um, there's more. <laughs> Just oh. like humans, beetles, and ants. Good. You guys are awesome. I hardly have to uh, <laughs> read my list off. Did anyone say rodents? I don't think so. So rodents can be pollinators too. There are um, specific flowers um, that rodents populate or pollinate. And uh, a fun fact, the world's largest pollinator lives in Madagascar and happens to be the lemur. Um, the lemurs pollinate uh, a tall species of palm tree called the traveler palms. And so when they go and eat the, or get the nectar, 
from those those flowers they spread it to the next tree and help to pollinate those trees so depending on what you consider large because technically humans could be pollinators inadvertently too but the lemur is the largest intentional pollinator so just a fun fact um as we talk about some of these pollinators um bumblebees actually happen to be one of our native pollinators along with other solitary bees like the mason bee leaf cutter bees and i do want to point out that bees are are not not to be feared um they are generally very docile and don't attack people on purpose um it is wasps and hornets that are more aggressive especially in the the latter part of summer when they're um looking their food sources are getting short um but when we talk about wasps as pollinators there are tiny what we'll call parasitic wasps that are beneficial insects those can also be pollinators too and there are little tiny flies um hover flies and uh wheat mitt or midge flies i'm i'm referring to wheat midge because i work a lot with the egg industry and so we monitor wheat midge populations um, that happens to be a pest but there are various midges that are basically tiny little flies that function as pollinators as well um, so when we think about some of these pollinators they can be attracted to um, different kinds and types of flowers and so that is important to be somewhat familiar with as we're um, designing our landscape. For example, butterflies, uh, they tend to be attracted to bright red and purple flowers that have faint but yet fresh odors. Uh, bees are attracted or tend to be attracted to white, yellow, or blue flowers that have contrasting ultraviolet patterns. And generally have a mild or pleasant odor. Uh, there is a special um, tiny bee that is attracted to um, the the vanilla the vanilla plant, and actually is the only kind of bee that is able to pollinate that. And they have done some some trials with. Well, right now most of the vanilla is hand pollinated, but it's a it's a lengthy process, and so they are working on ways to get the vanilla um, orchid <clears throat> to be able to be pollinated by other species other than this tiny bee. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, hummingbirds, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, uh, tend to be attracted to scarlet colors, oranges, reds, and white, especially tubular shaped flowers um, with no distinct odors. Moths, which tend to be most active at night, um there is an exception the acumon sphinx moth is active during the day that is um, also known as our hummingbird moth because it can um look or when it moves quickly it sounds and looks like a hummingbird because um, it does have a very long proboscis as well that's the the feeding part um but moths they tend to be attracted to pale reds purples pinks and white flowers that give off a strong sweet odor at night. To me, I would think of petunias. They tend to have a strong sweet odor. Beetles like soldier beetles and other beetles are attracted to white or green flowers uh, with odors that range from none to strongly fruity or foul. And flies like the tiny hoverfly, um, they tend to be attracted to green, white, or cream flowers with little odor or dark brown and purple flowers that have putrid odors. Um, the cocoa plant uh, happens to be pollinated by a tiny fly called a midge. So I just wanted to throw that out as a fun fact. Bats, which are also primarily active at night, um, they are attracted to dull white, green, or purple flowers that give off strong and musty odors at night. Um, if, you, <clears throat> if you like alcohol, like tequila, 
Uh, bats are responsible for pollinating the agave plants that make tequila. Um, bats also produce one of my favorite fruits, or pollinate one of my favorite fruits, bananas. I'm not a fan of mangoes, but they do pollinate mangoes and guava as well. So if anyone likes those types of fruits, uh, that's where bats can be beneficial as well. And going back to our native pollinators, there are more than 4,000 native bee species in North America. And according to TJ Prahashka, who is our area extension um, specialist in crop protection up here at the North Central Research Station in Minot, there are more than 250 solitary bees in North Dakota. And he will actually be sharing more on conserving solitary bees on April 16th during uh, the NDSU Spring Fever Garden Forum. So pollinator decline um, is happening in both managed and wild pollinators. Uh, managed pollinators would be our honeybees um, because they are, they are here during the summertime and then they are wintered in warmer states down south, um, maybe Florida, California, those types of places. Um, but both managed and wild po pollinators are facing similar stressors. Um, such as habitat loss. Um, we're starting to see alternate land uses interfering with overwintering, foraging, and nesting sites of our pollinators. Um, as I mentioned before, urban areas are replacing um, some of these habitats. Nutrition is also uh, another stressor. Um, the specific plants needed for nutrition and habitat are um, being replaced or declining. Um, and these native pollinators do need these specific plants for their various life stages. The monarch is a good example. Milkweed um, is specifically needed for the larval stage of, of the monarch. Climate change is also a, a stressor for our pollinators. Um, and how this affects them is that as we start to see climate change, more flowering plants might be starting to occur farther north than, than usual or at higher elevations, which can cause food sources to become out of sync uh, with our pollinator life cycles and migrations. We're also starting to see parasites and diseases. We've heard a lot about honeybee diseases, colony collapse disorders, those kinds of things. And as we're seeing right now with COVID, uh, our, our world is, is much more mobile. And so with more travel and commerce allows um, the extensive transfer of parasites and diseases and our pollinators are no exception. And so these non-native parasites and diseases can infect our native species um, and, and cause decline. Uh, the last stressor that all of our pollinators um, struggle with or face are uh, pesticides. And these can be herbicides, which are uh, pesticides designed to kill weeds, insecticides, and fungicides. Uh, insecticides kill insects, fungicides kill fungus. And some of this pesticide uh, damage can be from um, use in the environment, or it can actually happen when our beekeepers are trying to keep our bees healthy. Um, for example, with the, the mites that affect honeybees, there are um, pest or miticides that they can use to help protect the honeybees, but at the same time, those can be damaging to the honeybees. And so the other way that pesticides can um, harm our pollinators is by killing important forage plants that the pollinators need for nutrition. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, dandelions is a good example of a, a weed or what some might call a weed uh, being controlled by a pesticide. Dandelions actually provide really good early season forage for our native bees. So honeybee problems, this is just a little bit of a, a summary. 
uh, from the previous slide, but a little more detail on, on the honeybee problems. And again, more than a third of the world's crop species, um, such as alfalfa, sunflower, and numerous fruits and vegetables and seeds depend on bee pollination, particularly honeybees. Um, they are plagued by the varroa mites. Um, there are some diseases as well. The Israeli acute paralysis virus is an important virus that has been indicated in uh, colony collapse disorder. And the, that disease um, has probably been an introduced uh, disease from bees brought in from other countries um, or different species of bees. And then also with our honeybees, we tend to see some migratory stress. Since our honeybees are wintered in southern states like California and Florida, we see that migratory stress. The transportation of these bees across the country for pollination purposes and frequent moves um, cause high levels of stress. And as we know from our, ourselves, when we're under a lot of stress, um, our immune systems don't function as they should. Uh, additionally, poor nutrition um, is attributed to some of our honeybee problems. Um, and part of that is um, our, the monocultures that honeybees are being asked to feed upon. Uh, just like us, as humans, we need a diet um, that has a wide range of nutrients and vitamins and minerals. And so bees and other pollinators also need a mixed pollen diet um, rather than a single pollen source. Um, in some reviews of bee problems, um, bees feeding on monoculture crops have been likened to humans only eating sardines or chocolate or parsnips for a whole month at a time. So you can imagine how you might feel, even though you may be a huge chocolate lover, how you might feel after a whole month of eating nothing but chocolate. Um, and then pesticides. Uh, neo neonicotinoids are the main pesticide of concern, which is an insecticide. And so um, folks are trying to reduce the use of this particular pesticide because it can linger in the plants and as the bees feed upon the pollen and the nectar they can become um, exposed to it and because of all these different things combined not just one one particular item beekeepers are losing about a third of their hives per year so it's it's becoming a growing problem and as you can see it's it's not linked to just one particular um, stressor. So just um, a visual to uh, demonstrate the importance of pollinators and bees specifically. Um, this slide is uh, from Dr. Esther McGinnis. Uh, she's our NDSU Extension Specialist and Associate Professor in Horticulture. She's also um, my graduate school advisor. And I borrowed this slide from her uh, because it gives a good depiction of what might make up some traditional breakfast foods. We've got some fruits and we've got coffee, milk, bacon, eggs, um, some grains. And so in the next slide, um, we'll see what a breakfast looks like without bees or without pollinators. And so you can see that it looks pretty plain and, and pretty bland without out those fruits. And um, for those that are coffee lovers, we even lose the coffee. And if we think about how pollinators, whether they directly pollinate our, our foods or whether they're somehow involved in the process, we can probably even take milk out. Um, because even though our dairy cows um, do eat a fair amount of grains and when pollinated um, feed sources, they also have a large part of their diet is made up of hay, specifically alfalfa, which does need bees for pollination. So depending on how we look at pollination, we can probably take milk off the menu too 
if we don't have bees and other pollinators. So how can you help? Um, one of the, the popular initiatives these days um, is to build a, a pollinator garden and um, NDSU Extension has a pollinator program through our Master Gardener program. Um, folks can actually go online and if you just search in search NDSU Extension um, Master Gardener Pollinator Garden, you can find more information, information about building a pollinator garden and also about becoming a certified pollinator garden. And so the picture to the right is actually our pollinator garden that we have here in Pierce County. Um, our Pierce County Soil Conservation District uh, graciously allowed us to place it on their property. Uh, so building a pollinator garden is a great way to help pollinators. And planting other nectar and pollen producing plants uh, that bloom season long is another great way and also creating a pollinator friendly lawn and yard is another great way to help um, support pollinators and we'll talk a little bit more about each of these um, as we go forward when we're supporting pollinators in our landscape we need to think about their four basic needs they are essentially just like we are um, one of their basic needs is food and their food source happens to be nectar and or pollen. If it's a bee, usually pollen is involved. They also need a source of water and they need some type of shelter, um, primarily for nesting um, and, and just escaping predators. And then their fourth need is the sustainable use of pesticides. And we'll refer to that as integrated pest management because it's a, it's a whole system of looking at our pesticide use. These next few slides are, are going to focus primarily on tips if we were going to be building a pollinator garden, um, but can certainly work for adding any types of plants to our landscape. So if we're building a pollinator garden, we can select plants or we should select plants that bloom from early spring. So coming up, you know, the end of April, early May, all the way into late fall, um, probably late September, early October. Um, and usually we want to have at least 10 to 20 species. And we should include as many native plants as we can. And it is okay to include some non-natives. Uh, those can be beneficial uh, in the landscape as well and beneficial to pollinators. We, we do want to be careful with some of our non-native natives, especially some of the cultivars. The, um, a good example would be the double blossomed flowers. Sometimes in the genetic selection of those, uh, some of the reproductive parts can be lost or some of their nectar producing capabilities are lost. And so even though they're pretty, uh, they may not provide the nutrition that our pollinators need. And when we are mixing non-natives with our natives, um, generally we want to follow the 60-40 rule. So 60% native and 40%, no more than 40% non-native. And then when we're planting our uh, food sources for our pollinators, we also want to try to plant in drifts or clumps of three to five per species. And the reason for this is to help our pollinators find and use them. Uh, essentially, they become a landing zone. And another reason that we plant them in clumps is because some of our pollinators don't have um, a tremendous energy reserve. And so if those plants are a little bit closer together, it helps them to conserve energy as they're foraging. And we want to make sure that the natives that we're choosing are adapted to our local climate, um, soil, and our native pollinators. Um, here in my particular area up in north central North Dakota, 
Um, we are in the a zone three, reliably zone three. We may be able to get some zone four plants to survive um, if they have enough winter protection. So definitely match your plants to your growing zone. Um, a, a couple other things to consider that I didn't put on the slide because it would have just been too much text. Um, but since we do have some pollinators that are out at night, try to include some night blooming flowers that would support our moths and possibly bats. Uh, some examples of night bloomers, and most of these are annuals, um, would be moonflower. They smell really wonderful at night. They, they're, kind of, they're kind of a climbing vining plant, almost like a morning glory, um, and they do bloom white. Um, but they can look really pretty in the moonlight and they smell delicious. Um, another annual is night phlox. Um, Nicotiana is another annual. Um, and then also another fun one, um, kind of an old fashioned garden favorite is four o'clock. Those tend to start blooming um, in the afternoon and last into the evening. And then um, a perennial would be evening primrose, which is supposed to be hardy for zones three through 11. So definitely add some night blooming flowers in your variety. And then another thing to consider is to vary the sizes of the plants um, to accommodate some of our tiny uh, solitary predators, or I'm sorry, pollinators. <laughs> Um, some examples of plants that would have smaller flowers or blossoms to accommodate these tiny pollinators would be species from the mint family. Um, also plants from the carrot family, such as dill, or one of our native plants, golden alexander. Golden alexander kind of resembles dill in its blossoming. And since you're probably wondering what all of these plants look like, because I did not show pictures, if you get a chance, um, I did post the link, but you can also Google beautiful landscapes building a pollinator garden. This is one of our NDSU extension publications. And there is a chart of our native plants um, by season. So that can give you some ideas and there are pictures in there. And then sources of native plants. Um, the first thing would be to check with your local nursery um, because they will be the best source to be able to get native plants that can grow for your particular location. Um, some alternative sources. You can Google the Prairie Moon Nursery, um, Prairie Restorations and Morning Sky. And these also have catalogs available if you're like me and you like to flip through a catalog versus um, scrolling through an online catalog, um, you may be able to request a catalog from these. And that will also give you some good ideas of what these plants look like. And on a dreary day, well, it's dreary here. <laughs> so on a dreary day like today, uh, flipping through a plant catalog can bring great joy. Some other food sources besides plants to consider um, would be putting cut fruit out um, for our butterflies and bees, and then also a hummingbird feeder. Um, the cut fruit and the hummingbird solution or hummingbird feeder solution um, serves as an energy source. The sugars in those two items serve as an energy source. That's essentially what these pollinators are acquiring from the pollinator plants when they're feeding on the nectar. And I should have posted a recipe. I'm sure there will be questions about um, hummingbird feeder recipes, um, and I can answer this in more detail later, but just a quick overview. Um, it's generally a one to four solution of sugar and water. It is recommended only to use refined sugar over other sweeteners such as honey or brown sugar. And the reason for this is some of the other sweeteners um, can contain 
um, fungus or, or develop mold that can be harmful to the hummingbirds. And so a simple recipe for a hummingbird feeder solution is just one fourth a cup sugar, one cup boiling water, and then you just dissolve the sugar in the water, let it cool down, and put it into your hummingbird feeder. feeder. There's no need for the red dye. Um, some of the chemicals in the dye can be harmful to the hummingbirds. And then also make sure with your hummingbird feeder that if it's hot, that you're emptying and cleaning it at least two times per week. And when you clean it, make sure that um, you are cleaning it with hot tap water or a very weak um, vinegar solution. We want to avoid using dish soaps because they can leave some residues that can be harmful to our hummingbirds. And then every time that the hummingbird feeder is empty, especially in a period of heavy feeding, um, go ahead and clean it before you refill it. Oops. I'm not sure what I did, Julie. <laughs> there we go. I clicked on the link. I'm sorry about that. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so our next um, need for pollinators is a water source. And we have a variety of ways that we can get water for our pollinators. On the right hand side, I have a super simple way um, where you can take the saucer of a plant container and just fill it with some glass or some colored beads or pebbles or rocks and then put water in it. And the purpose of that is that the pollinators will then have a landing spot so they don't drown in the water. So the other uh, water sources on the left hand side, like the bird bath and the fountain or ponds, um, we do want to make sure that we have something in them that the pollinators can land on. Um, so some type of landing platform. So for example, in a bird bath, we might just float a piece of wood in the bird bath so that our bees and butterflies can land on them and not drown. They will drink from the edges, but sometimes they can fall in. Um, I know when I've changed my bird bath, I've sometimes found casualties. Um, sometimes they get in there. Um, the other thing with our bird baths and our bodies of water, um, even the the saucer on the right with the water in it, we do want to try and change that water frequently. This benefits both the birds and the bees, no pun intended. Um, and it just, de because it decreases um, the chance for molds and funguses and, and bacteria to grow that could thicken them. Um, and also it decreases the mosquito breeding grounds so that we have less mosquitoes in our yard. The third need for pollinators is shelter. And this is both for um, safety and for nesting. Um, with our native bees, we have um, what we call cavity nesting bees and ground nesting bees. A lot of our native solitary bees are ground nesters. And one of the most fun ones that I've come across is um, they're called sweat bees and or metallic bees. They have a bright iridescent green color and they're about the size of a house fly and they burrow in the ground. They are a ground nesting bee. They're very, very docile. They will come and they will land on your, on your skin and that's probably why they've gotten their nickname sweat bees because they like the salty flavor of our, our skin from our sweat. Um, so we want to have some bee houses, which I've pictured or posted a picture of an example on the right. You want to have various size holes because our native bees are varying sizes. And so some have different preferences. And you'll notice on the top of the, the peak of the bee house, there are some uh, wood chips in there. And then in the bottom um, behind the chicken wire are pine cones. 
And so some of our native pollinators prefer those sources for nesting as well. We also want to save some bare ground. If we're building a pollinator garden, we want to try not to cover all of it up with mulch or fabric. We want to leave a little bit of bare ground uh, for our ground nesting bees. Dead trees also provide, although they can be an eyesore, um, they provide a nice habitat for our cavity nesting um, natives, native pollinators. Um, something that I've done in my yard if I've had a dead tree is I've cut it up into a big log and used it as a decorative focal piece in my flower beds for some of these native pollinators. So it can be a matter of just getting creative. Um, also bundles of hollow stems like those of sunflowers um, are preferred by some cavity nest nesters. And then one thing that can be hard for some gardeners is to um, resist the urge to cut down our perennials in the fall because there are some of our native pollinators that will nest in those hollow stems. And if we, if we can resist the urge to cut them down in the fall, the next thing is to resist the urge to not cut them down too soon in the springtime either. Generally, the rule of thumb is if you've left them up over the fall, uh, leave them standing until you see the first bumblebee um, in the landscape in the spring. Um, fun fact is that 70% of bees live in nests below ground. And the other 30% of bees live in cavities, such as plant stems or holes bored in trees by woodpeckers or beetle larvae. Some bees can um, hollow out um, or core out wood themselves, others cannot. So they'll lay their eggs in hollow stems or nest in them. Um, some other creative ways. Uh, to provide shelter in your landscape would be a rustic arbor or bench made from some kind of natural untreated wood. Um, split rail fence. I myself happen to be keen on split rail fences. We can do some neat things with those. Um, the main thing is just to provide a variety of different structure types for our natives. And the fourth need for our pollinators is sustainable pesticide use. And by sustainable pesticide use, we're able to still use pesticides, we just have to use them responsibly. And when we're using integrated pest management, we're combining a variety of different techniques. Um, we're, we're combining cultural, physical um, barriers, all of those kinds of things, natural pests, natural enemies, um, before we're employing uh, the use of a pesticide. And we do that so that we can try to um, minimize the effects of pesticide use on humans and the environment. So when we're sustainably using a pesticide, the number one thing that we want to do, whether we're trying to control weeds, or insects or some other kind of pest is to identify the pest and make sure that we've identified it correctly. Next, we want to determine if control measures are actually needed. So is the problem severe enough to warrant a treatment? Or in the case of maybe vegetable production or an agronomic, other agronomic crop, is the expected loss from the pest acceptable? Or does it cost less than controlling a treatment? Or does it cost less than control treatment? It, if it costs less than the control, the treatment may not be needed, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, and third, we don't want to use a pesticide unless there's a definite reason to do so. So in some cases, the problem might take care of itself naturally. Um, by predatory insects um, or a change in weather. When we, in, in the springtime, that's an, a nice example. Um, it might be nice and warm, things are starting to get active, and then all of a sudden we get a cool spell. 
And that can be one of those um, natural events that can decline a, a pest problem. Um, grasshoppers don't like cool, wet weather. So if we have a cool, wet spring, we may have a decrease in our grasshopper population, which might be a good thing. Um, predatory insects, we have ladybugs and lacewings. They might take care of some of our aphid problems for us without having to apply a pesticide. Um, so using the beneficial insects to help us keep pest populations down is a big part of integrated pest management and sustainable pesticide use. And then the other thing to remember is that pesticides seldom discriminate. If we're using a pesticide like an insecticide, um, it's going to kill the good bugs along with the bad. When I get calls in the office and I get a lot of them, um, the number one thing people want to know is what can they spray to kill a particular pest on a particular plant in their landscape. And so the first thing that I go over with them is this point that whether they're spraying, whether they're targeting the bad insect, they're still going to be killing the good. And so then we back up to um, the second point or the third point where we don't want to use a pesticide unless there's a definite need to do so. So is the damage that that pest is going to cause warranting the use of, of a pesticide? And then number six is to make sure that the pest is present. Naturally, we've identified it, but we also want to make sure that it's in a vulnerable stage before we're treating it. Some pests, insect pests, once they get to a certain size, aren't as vulnerable to the pesticide. Weeds are another great example. Once they get bigger than three to four inches, they're harder to kill and can become more resistant. And then the last point in using pesticides responsibly or incorporating an integrated pest management is that we want to choose the right pesticide. We want to make sure both the pest and the plant that we're treating are on the label um, because the label is the law and we have to follow the label requirements. And then since we're talking about the label, we do want to make sure that we look at the label and um, pay attention to any safety precautions, mixing instructions, special application instructions, um, personal protective equipment that might be needed to apply that that particular pesticide. So some special considerations uh, for pollinators regarding pesticide use. We only want to apply pesticides, of course, when we need to, but if we are going to have to make a pesticide application, we only want to do it when pollinators are inactive. And our bees and other pollinators typically are active and foraging during periods of high temperature and sunlight. Um, so we don't wanna be spraying our pesticides during that key peak of the day. So we might be spraying in the early morning or in the early evening hours to avoid our pollinator foraging times. Also, um, high temperatures can cause some pesticides to vaporize which can increase the potential for pollinator or off-target plant injury. So we want to examine the area that we're going to be applying a pesticide to, and if there are bees or other pollinators actively foraging on the flowering weeds or plants, we want to postpone that pesticide application until they're no longer foraging. We also want to be cognizant of residual activity of pesticide. Um, this is an important factor in determining safety to pollinators. Generally, the shorter the re-entry interval listed on the label, the sh that means the less residual activity. So the shorter the re-entry inter re interval generally means a shorter residual activity period or less persistence. We also want to try to minimize drift um, to non-target plants. 
or plants that bees might forage on. And generally, applications should not be made if wind speeds exceed 10 miles per hour or are blowing towards adjacent flowering plants. And then we also want to choose the lowest toxicity possible. And um, that will generally be indicated on the label. Um, there will be signal words such as caution, warning, danger. They give a general idea of toxicity level. Um, caution is the lowest toxicity level and danger being the highest toxicity level. Um, also, I do want to point out that some of our organic and natural um, pesticides do not necessarily mean non-toxic to pollinators. Some of our organics and naturals can be just as toxic as our synthetic pesticides. So some other things to consider when we're thinking about supporting pollinators in our landscape is to consider the use of trees. And flowering trees can be a very important source of pollen and nectar uh, for our pollinators, especially in the springtime. Um, this is usually when our tired and overwintered bees and other native pollinators are emerging and they need that, that immediate source of nutrition and sustenance. Um, Maples and willows are notable trees um, that provide an early supply of food. Uh, apples and cherries uh, tend to bloom a little bit later, but they provide uh, beautiful blossoms and very good food as well. The other neat thing about trees, besides providing an early supply of food for our pollinators, is that they provide a large amount of food at one time when the full tree is blooming. Um, American basswood or linden um, is one of the best nectar producers that we have, um, aside from our fruit trees, of course. Um, it will attract many bees and, and other pollinators. I've pu put a picture here of um, the American linden or American basswood, and then also um, in the side, a picture of the blossoms. They actually smell really good too. Um, and if you're fortunate to see one in bloom, uh, there will generally be a lot of bees and pollinators around it. Um, if you have a small yard, uh, trees might be um, an option for you to be able to maximize the amount of pollinator food that you can provide if you don't have enough space to incorporate a pollinator garden. Another way that we can support pollinators in our urban landscapes um, is by creating a pollinator friendly lawn. And we can do this in a, in a number of different ways. Um, we can intentionally reduce the size of our lawn, maybe turning some of it into a, a pollinator garden or a habitat for pollinators. Um, we can also cut down on our mowing, um, maybe mow every other week and allow the grass to grow up to three inches or higher. Some of our lawn grasses will produce seed heads uh, that will attract grass pollinators. Um, also, we want to uh, try to rethink our um, ideal of the perfect lawn and maybe allow some low growing flowering plants or as some might call them, weeds to grow um, because these can be especially um, valuable uh, nutrition and forage for our pollinators as well. Uh, dandelions, I mentioned them before, they are an excellent early season source of nutrition for our native pollinators. Um, also, there are some low growing clovers. You may have clover, white clover growing in your lawn that you've been trying to get rid of for years. Um, go ahead and let it grow because that is actually a really good source of nutrition for uh, our pollinators as well. And additionally, um, the clover can decrease our fertilizer needs in our lawn. So it can decrease the nitrogen needs uh, as it is a legume. 
And so that in turn can help us to cut down on some of our fertilizer use in our lawn if we're after that lush green lawn, um, which may help us to support our pollinators. And I have to sneeze, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm talking about fertilizer and fertilizers always make me sneeze. Um, another thing that we can do with our lawn, and this relates to allowing those um, flowering plants, or as some like to call them, weeds, to grow rather than using a pesticide. So those are a couple ways that we can cut down on, on some of the um, chemical use in our, our lawns. Uh, another option is to leave an area of the lawn um, as a, a no-mow zone, as suggested in the image to the right. And you can see in the background there are dandelions that have grown in the, in the lawn and been allowed to go to seed. Uh, another option that seems to be gaining some popularity um, is the what they call no mow fescue lawns. They're they're really maybe it's maybe a little misleading because I don't think they're truly no mow, but they need considerably less attention than our traditional Kentucky bluegrass and and other types of lawns. So those are some options for helping us to create a pollinator friendly lawn. And I didn't include a slide for this, um, but um, if you really have a small space, you can also look into um, growing some pollinator friendly plants in containers on your porch or your balcony um, or whatever other small space that you have. And then um, to round this out, I just want to remind everyone um, that in June, we have our National Pollinator Week. And so that would be hopefully a great time to um, start look, looking at um, extra ways that we can help the pollinators uh, in our areas. Um, there will be, I'm sure, lots of different activities nationwide uh, that we can participate in. Um, and uh, hopefully by then, uh, our current uh, social distancing situation uh, we'll be letting up some and and we can participate in some of those um, activities and so with that I guess I will open it up to questions okay well thank you so much that was a great great webinar so just a couple comments Kathy says our honeybees we see escapees and they'll die come winter and Shelley said Generally, honeybees have a hive somewhere. They can range up to five miles to forage. Honeybees without a hive will die. So do you have any other commentary on that question or thought? I guess that I, 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 I don't know enough about the, the honeybees, but generally, yes, they do require a hive. And what I can share is that if you see a, a swarm of honeybees, um, that generally means that they've gotten pushed out of their hive and are looking for a new hive. And so the best thing to do in a situation like that um, is to call a local beekeeper um, and see if they will come um, take them. Um, you can also look on, if you don't know of a local beekeeper, you can look on the North Dakota Department of Ag um, website and there is a listing, a map listing of apiaries in the area. Um, I should have maybe posted a slide of that, but I already had a lot of talking points. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered your question. Well, Shelly tells us, and this is great to know, she is a master beekeeper and she's taught honey beekeeping for four years. So maybe sometime you can do a webinar for us, Shelly. That would be wonderful. <laughs> I uh, have another question here, or here's first a comment. We have a huge basswood tree in our yard and uh, Jennifer was glad to hear it's so beneficial and she hasn't smelled the blooms. Uh, we have a question from Erin. What attracts wasps to the garden? Generally, we if there's rotting fruit or some kind of um, other rubbish nearby that might attract them. Generally in the early part of the summer 
We won't see them a whole lot. They'll become more active in the latter part of the summer as they begin foraging, as their food sources get shorter and they start foraging to prepare for um, either overwintering or migrating. So it looks like we have um, a couple questions here. Um, Shelly, our beekeeper, says the best time to manage wasps in, is in the spring when their populations are small using traps. So thank you, Shelly. Um, Jeannie says, I read that a native bee house needs to be six inches deep to produce healthy female bees and it needs to be completely cleaned every year. I don't know on the measurements. Um, I know they vary, but I can say that, yes, they should be cleaned. And Charlotte says she has a, an oregano plant growing in her herb garden, and she noticed the bees are attractive to the flowers of the plant. Thank you. I forgot to mention herbs. Yes, herbs are a wonderful source for pollinators. Oregano, borage, um, pretty much any chives, they love chives too. So yes, definitely incorporating herbs into your landscape is, is a great source of food for our pollinators. Thank you for sharing. Oh, and Jennifer, I missed her question as I was going through. She says it's, she's sad to see how many bees get killed in pools. Do you know any products to put in a pool to help them float on? Um, I don't know of any specifically, but an idea that comes to mind might be pool noodles or, or those types of things. Does anyone else have any ideas on that? And we have another question, and I think we'll have to let everyone go since we're a little, little late, but thank you for, for answering all these. Uh, Lila asks, are cat mints like walkers low good for pollinators? I'm not sure on the specific variety, but yes, the cat mint family is in the mint family. And yes, they are a pollinator species as well. And I'll add in a comment. Um, we just put some brand new herb guides. I'm a food and nutrition specialist, so there's a lot of recipes as well as growing herbs, and it's on the Field to Fork website. So sounds like we have some people growing herbs, so you've got some new resources. Any last question? Oh, here we go. Shelly says, if the first water source a honeybee finds is a pool, the hive will water there most frequently. Floating wood, pool noodles, etc., work well. So thank you, Shelly. So you have some more options besides the pool noodles. Well, with that, I'm going to wrap up the um, webinar for today. And I thank you all for your participation. And very good job, Yolanda. And you brightened our day. So thank you for doing this. Thank you.